Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone had a, a pleasant weekend. Uh, beautiful weather. You know, at first I thought it was going to rain a lot more, but it didn't. So that was that was pleasant. Um, as I said before, I'm accustomed to a lot of rain this time of year, and so I'm very, very happy uh, that Mother Nature uh, has cooperated, that we've had some very pleasant weather. And this year, for some reason, the pollen doesn't seem to be bothering me as much, which is, again, a blessing. I Normally, I don't, I don't take any allergy medicine or anything like I think I mentioned before. I just, I just swore off of it because I didn't think it really did me any good because everybody's different, but it hasn't seemed to have, have affected me as much this year. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. Now, what we want to do today, and like I say, I uh, uh, appreciate your uh, attention to the last test. I posted solutions on the, you know, the tab for test three, and please go through those, and I'll have some results for you uh, soon uh, as I look over your test work. So I appreciate your uh, attending to that and, and being very uh, mindful of the um, timetable and all. That was very good. And submitting your, your test work, all of that was uh, very well done. And I appreciate that. It, it's online means there are lots of responsibilities. And so I, I'm very uh, happy that, that you were able to take care of those. Now, for today, what we're going to do is continue with the convergence topics, but I think these particular series tests will be something that you enjoy. We're gonna find them to be very useful. Uh, the ones we've already done are obviously very useful, uh, but the two new tests that we will talk about today uh, will be the ratio test and the root test. So let's go ahead and get started. When, when we talk about a particular convergence test for a real series, we're often associating uh, the patterns that we see in the series. For instance, if we have an alternating series, a real alternating series, then we, we kind of gravitate to the alternating series test. Uh, we, we, we look for uh, functions that can be converted to real valued functions and apply the integral test. We, we think about P-series and the harmonic series when we try to apply the comparison tests. And of course, the geometric series also is a great source of comparison. So what we're going to find is that as we learn more tests, you might be able to apply more than one test, or you may apply a test that doesn't appear to work. So, so that's what's nice about the uh, test that we're going to talk about today. You're going to find them to be very useful, but in certain cases, there might be a, an instance where, where you don't get a conclusion. And, and I think that's going to be something very easy for you to see because we'll have a lot of nice examples uh, that we've already worked on. Now, what I want to do is state the actual theorems and uh, towards the end of the lecture, I want to go over the justification for the convergence of the root test. Both of the tests can be basically uh, justified with the same uh, arithmetic and the same convergence theory that we've already developed. So, so I think you're going to find them to be uh, very user friendly. So the first theorem is the uh, ratio test. And this is a this is a class favorite. It's always it's always something that students enjoy because it, it just seems to be very appealing. So we call this the ratio test because there is indeed a ratio. So what we're going to do is suppose just a simple, very simple hypothesis. Suppose a sub n, the nth term, is a sequence of non-zero terms. The idea here is that we, we want to be able to take ratios of successive terms for any n. And so we, we don't want the case of division by zero. So we're basically 
uh, demanding that we have non-zero terms in the sequence. So the nth term always produces something non-zero. And what we want to do is set a particular limit. Now, one thing we're gonna notice about this particular uh, series test is that it is a test for absolute convergence because of the absolute value that we're using here. So we remember that absolute convergence implies uh, conditional convergence. That is, this is a very powerful test. So I'll just say test for absolute convergence. So again, you're thinking, well, if there's no, if there's no sign change or alternation in sign or whatever, it, it, the, the impact is not as grand, obviously. But, but still, uh, as we work with uh, power series and things, we're going to find this particular test to be extremely useful. And, and again, uh, to set up what we call symmetric intervals about zero or other numbers. So this is kind of the main idea here. And this is where the name ratio test comes from. Basically, we look at the ratio of successive terms in absolute value, and then we allow n to pass to infinity. And that's what we assign the letter L to be. Then we have some uh, nice uh, conclusions here. The first one is the one we'll use the most. If L is zero or less than one. That is, we have a limit, a unique limit in this range. Then this implies that the series generated by this nth term converges absolutely. Now, you might be wondering, at least from the outset, we're going to do several examples of these. Um, the ratio test is very useful for obvious reasons when we have lots of exponents and then even factorials and then alternation in sign because many of those types of expressions absorb in a very convenient way. And so the limit here once we simplify becomes very simple or at least less complicated than maybe having to work with an inequality or, or an improper integral or something like that. So, so there will be instances when you're gonna look at the nth term and say, yeah, that's the, that's the ratio test. I'm gonna try the ratio test. So again, we will always compute this limit here in the box when we apply the ratio test. And of course, the first uh, condition here is that if the limit, again, zero to less than one, like one third, zero, three fifths, four fifths, whatever, that would mean that the given series converges absolutely. Number two, if L in this particular case is greater than one or L, and this is kind of an abuse of notation, L is infinity. And of course that really doesn't make sense, but say we get infinity as a limit. And you know, we're, we're often flexible with math, at least here. Uh, if you actually compute this limit and you get something that's well greater than one as a finite number, or you get something that diverges to infinity, then this implies, as you probably already think, that the series generated by the nth term a sub n uh, diverges. Now, one that's kind of surprising for students at this point, because we haven't had a condition like this with any of the other tests. And that, that's something that, that makes these tests rather unique. Um, usually, if, if a particular set of hypotheses don't apply, then we can't use the test, you know, but we love, we love the tests that are very robust, like the, like the integral test. That's a very nice test. Others, maybe we have to work harder and they don't always apply, or we can't get the inequality to work, 
or it's not, we can't show that it's not increasing. I mean, it, there, there are all kinds of things that could get in the way, but we could have a situation which you see I've conveniently left out. If L is actually one, then we don't have a conclusion. Test is inconclusive. So what, what this basically says is that, and it's actually true for series that we already understand in terms of con uh, convergence, um, that we would not get a conclusion. And so, so the idea is that when, when we try to justify these tests, they are dependent on an upper bound of a geometric convergent series. And so that precludes the one, so to speak. We, we, we are looking for something where we have a common ratio in absolute value less than one. And then of course, when we hit one, it's not like it's terrible. You know, maybe it converges, maybe it diverges. We don't know. And so that's when the uh, directive here is with inclusive, you say, okay, well, maybe I'll just apply another test or maybe, maybe I would have avoided the ratio test from the very beginning because maybe, maybe we decided that, okay, this would be a better uh, candidate for this test or whatever, maybe the comparison test or maybe a better candidate just to go directly uh, to the alternating series test. So, so it, it's not going to be a surprise that this will happen. One thing that's important, though, is that don't get lulled into the false premise that, that number one includes one. So this is very important. It, and it's the same for the, ratio, uh, the root test. This is very important. We always say, oh, one's a good number. We're, we're good. Not with the ratio test not with the root test. Now, the next theorem, and we're going to do several examples of this because you're going to need to see them. The next theorem will be the root test. And again, the name is aptly given because we basically have to uh, execute an nth root. So again, this is a test for absolute convergence. So very powerful. Now with the root test, we're thinking if we have lots of nth powers, we can undo them with the nth root, n times one over n, giving us the one. So again, we, we don't want to force a difficult limit by using the root test when it really doesn't make a lot of sense. So. So again, you might be thinking, we'll probably get more use out of the ratio test, but when appropriate, the root test really does get us to the finish line very quickly. So in the same essence here, we don't, we don't need the, uh, the hypothesis of non-zero terms that we can always take the square root of zero. So, so this particular hypothesis that we have for the ratio test is not required at this time, but we do set L to be a particular limit. So in this case, we're going to have the limit as n passes to infinity. And I'll write this with the uh, uh, 1 over n power uh, instead of the square root with the index. I mean, that's fine and it looks really nice, but it's a little bit difficult, difficult for computations. So what I'll do is I'll have the absolute value of the nth term and, and I'm putting parentheses here, but I could just put the one over n right outside, but just to make it clear, we take the absolute value and then we apply the nth root. So you don't necessarily have to have these parentheses. I'm just trying to make it very clear that that's what we're doing. Now, again, what we'll usually do is just like up here, we will make every effort to simplify what's, the, what's inside, that is the argument of the absolute value, and then basically remove them. So we will, we will apply the absolute value, remove it, and then we'll pass to the limit. 
or we'll apply the nth root and pass to the limit. So, so again, this is like doing an improper integral. We don't want to jump ahead. We want to take our time to let the algebra reduce the, the complexity and then move to the limit, just like we're thinking of an improper integral. So again, the, uh, the conclusions are the same. If we get a limit, zero or less than one, this implies, again, absolute convergence. That is, if we look at the series of n equal one to infinity of a sub n, this converges absolutely. So, so I guess I guess what's nice about these two uh, uh, tests, that's why they're always paired together, is that they're very similar in conclusion. And then, of course, like the last one, if L is greater than one, or if we get an infinite limit, then that's what we expect, divergence, n equal one to infinity of a sub n diverges. And then of course, just like with the last one, if we get a limit of one, then we have an inconclusive test. And what I might do is just do an example uh, of, of three uh, to, to show you how this works. Um, many, many times a student will say, okay, well, I didn't get anything. Don't feel like you've wasted your time. It's like trying an integral and a particular technique and it doesn't work. That's okay. That, that, that's part of the process. Um, you know, you, you always hope that you can apply a conjugate method and not have to use the Weierstrass substitution. But, but, you know, when you have to use it, you got to do it. And so you do, you do the algebra, you reduce it, and then you apply the techniques to a much simpler integral. Now, like I said before, the best way, and, and this, is where, this is where you can look uh, at these sections as, okay, right now it looks like we're doing these new tests, but as you work through all of this, and if you see an opportunity to use another test, use it, use two different tests. I mean, don't, don't think that you push everything away because what the author is trying to do is basically say, okay, uh, and, and what I tell you to do, um, try any test. I mean, there might just be a situation where they don't necessarily purport that you use a particular test like ratio or root. They'll just say, figure out convergence or divergence. So let me give you some examples that show the utility of this particular uh, set of tests. So we have n equals one to infinity, n minus one factorial divided by four to the n. Now, again, if we look at this, we see, we see that, that this is where we find that the ratio test is very useful. Um, factorials are really an odd bird, so to speak. Um, there's a, a lot of number theoretic and combinatorial type uh, characteristics of these functions, and, and they just come up all over the place. They come up in, in Taylor's theorem, uh, analysis calculus that we're doing, uh, combinatorial problems, probability, number theoretic problems. They're just all over the place. And so, so when we have factorials, the first thing that comes to mind is ratio tests because we can simplify factorials by taking ratios. And that's the, that's the key here. So I'll write proof because really every time we do a, uh, a convergence test, it's a proof. I mean, I guess every problem we ever do in math is really a proof. So the first thing we want to do is look at the limit as n tends to infinity. And I'll go ahead for most of these and write down what it is we're supposed to do because you're still getting used to this. You're looking at the limit of the ratio. Now, what I usually tell students to do is when you apply the division here is to go ahead and reciprocate or that is invert and multiply instead of writing a, 
a large complex fraction. So what we can do is say this equals the limit as n passes to infinity, do your absolute value bar. And then for a sub n plus one, we just replace all the n's with n plus one. So we get n plus one minus one factorial. Again, this is very, this is very uh, recipe-like, okay? Very recipe-like, unlike uh, the other ones that we've done, even though the integral test was recipe-like, there was a lot of execution with calculus uh, and things that, that really required you to apply previous knowledge. And then we replace n with n plus one, four to the n plus one. Now, the, the easy part is division by a sub n. Just take the actual nth term and flip it. And so we'll have four to the n divided by n minus one factorial, just like that. Okay, now you might be looking at all of this and say, well, Professor Ryan, these all are positive things. And so they are, and so we'll be able to retire uh, the absolute values. But first what I want to do is just give you some hints about this. You, you all are good at algebra and this doesn't require complicated algebra that, that maybe you have to do with integration and things. So first, what we're going to do is put all the factorials together. So of course the ones absorb and we have n factorial. And then of course we have n minus one factorial. And then we can put all the powers of four together. So we have four to the n and four to the n plus one. And now if you will, and how many steps you put in this process? Uh, again, I just need to see the thought process. And so, so as long as I can follow your work as I always do, it, it's fine. So notice now, of course, we're just gonna use the definition of factorial. This will be n times n minus one factorial divided by n minus one factorial. And then of course we can use the laws of exponents. So we have four to the n divided by four times four to the n. So again, n plus one, that'll just give us a four to the one times four to the n. Now at this point, if you like, since all of these are non-negative, you can go ahead and retire the absolute values. That, that, that's not gonna be an issue anymore. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity. And notice the n minus ones factorial, they absorb and the four to the n's, they absorb. And so what are we left with? Well, we have in this case, we have an n over four, n divided by four. And if you like, you can go ahead and factor the one fourth limit as n passes to infinity of n. Now, this was one thing you might've been looking at at this point. This factorial function grows really, really fast. And it actually surpasses exponential functions, if you can believe that. And this has a lot to do with Sterling's formula in probability theory. Uh, so what we see here is that the limit is of n as n passes to infinity is clearly infinity. And of course, one fourth times infinity is infinity. So when we think about what we just did, this is test two or conclusion two. So L is actually infinity. So this implies the given. And so that's why I think students like this test or they feel like, well, I can, I can, I can do the ratio test because it appears to be a little bit more user friendly. So we can say diverges by ratio test. And of course, we really need to write out the ratio because do we need mean root test or ratio test? So we can't be as, 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 as lazy here. So, so again, when it comes to application of this, 
you can often look at the nth term and say, I'm not so sure that, that the four to the n will grow fast enough. So again, like L'Hopital's rule, the, the ratio test is very good. You're thinking, am I gonna be able to absorb enough terms so that the actual limit is where I need it to be? And so you were looking at this and probably thinking it's probably not gonna be the case that this particular result uh, uh, converges. Now let's look at another one. Now, one thing that, that we can find, and I will say this, when it comes to working with the ratio test, just like the root test, you might often run into some special limits and that's good. And if you have your, your card of special limits, you can always use them or you can do a little sidebar, but they will come up. That's why I made that uh, list of special limits. They, they will uh, be used by us uh, in the sequel. So we have N squared, five over six to the N. Now, when you look at this and you think about this, you, you, you think, okay, uh, hmm, if I were gonna try to do the comparison test, it's like, well, do I need to try to compare it to a geometric? Uh, what about that N squared? How am I gonna deal with that? Uh, the, the, the nice thing about the ratio test is that it does kind of fill in the gap where you might not have a really good comparison nth term. So when you look at this particular series, you're thinking, well, you know, that n squared is kind of bad news, but, but it's only to the second power. And I've got this five, six to the n, and that, that looks like, well, that's by itself is a convergent geometric series. And you're thinking, is this enough to counter this factor here? And so what we want to do is say, okay, just to be on the safe side, let's apply the ratio test. Again, we've got some powers here. So this might be a really good candidate for ratio test. So again, what this is doing is giving us more, uh, more choices. So now again, we look at the ratio of the successive terms. Again, when we talk about a sub n here, we're including everything, okay? Um, you remember with the alternating series test, I used like a u sub n because I had to have something that included the alternating part and the a sub n was just the part divorced from the uh, alternating part, which was the positive part. So, so or the non-negative part. So, so here, this is referring to everything here. And I, I wanna make that clear. Um, the, the times when I do change the notation will just be to make sure that everything is clear. So now when we look at this, we'll go ahead and substitute like we did in the previous problem. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity. Now we have a sub n plus one. So let's replace n with n plus one. So we get n plus one quantity squared and we get five, six to the n plus one. Now everything's in the numerator. So now when we divide, we'll just do something like this, invert and multiply. And then of course, that's just the a sub n as it is. So this is n squared and this is five, six to the n. Okay, so very simple to construct this. And now let's go ahead and put everything together. You can retire the uh, absolute values, but let's just leave them in for one more step and then we'll, we'll get rid of them. All of these are clearly positive. So let's put all of our n's together. We're gonna have n plus one quantity squared and we're gonna have n squared. And then we're gonna have our uh, geometric parts. So we're gonna have five, six to the n plus one and five, six to the N. So now again, positive, so we can retire all of that, the absolute value bars. Now, one thing we can do here is just like we, we do often when we're doing improper integrals or working with logarithms, we just put everything under the same umbrella and use continuity. So we're gonna have N plus one 
over n quantity squared. And then of course over here, we're gonna have, and I'll just put a bracket here. I'll have five, six to the n times five, six using the laws of exponents. So now of course, the powers here, the nth powers absorb. So we get the limit as n passes to infinity. So we have the n plus one divided by n quantity squared times five over six. Now, of course, at this point, if you like, you can factor the five, six, since it's a constant, we've got a limit. And then if you like, you can run the limiting process inside. You don't have to, this is like a pre-calculus limit, but it's fine if you do. So now what we can see, if we pass to the limit, we get the five six. And then of course the limit inside is just the ratio of leading coefficients, which is one. So we get a one. So five six times one is five six. Now, of course, this number is less than one. So this implies the given series, n equals one to infinity of n squared times five, six to the n converges by root test, or excuse me, by ratio test. So this is where you look at this and you're not really sure what the level of convergence is. And then of course, there, there are cases where just like if we don't have a telescoping series or we don't have a geometric series, we, we don't have a convenient sum and then we have to use methods of approximation. And, and that that's, you know, again, we have to figure out, well, how many terms do we need uh, to, to have a decent approximation? And so when we look at this, it's not very clear, you know, we're thinking, okay, is, is, is this enough here to counter this? And we see that it is. So, so there's certain things about the, the finite nature of this power that maybe tend to make us think that, that yeah, there's a possibility for convergence. And so, so the ratio test opens the door to that. Otherwise we'd be like, well, it looks like it converges and, and that's no good. So, so like I said before, these are the standard, uh, ladies and gentlemen, standard convergence tests. There are others and you can make adjustments to these, but these tests are used most often and, and are, are very, uh, very uh, useful in the types of computations that you need to do in future mathematics courses, as well as uh, physics, science, and uh, engineering. So, so like I said before, you will run into some other types of tests uh, as they are needed in, in uh, subsequent courses. Now what I wanted to do was throw in uh, some alternating stuff and then make a comment. Um, let's look at, look at this particular setup here. So we have n equals zero to infinity, and we have a negative one to the n plus one. And then we've got n plus two, and then we have n times n plus one. Now, when you look at this particular problem, you're thinking, well, you know, this is an alternating series. And you don't have any powers of n, so you're thinking, okay, well, you know, I'll use the alternating series test. But you're thinking, well, what what does the uh, ratio test do for us? You know, you're thinking, is 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 this something new? Can I can I try the ratio test and maybe get uh, at an answer or whatever? So what I wanted to do was use this particular. Uh, real series as an example of one of the other conditions that we have, or, or one of the other conclusions. So let's look at this. Let me adjust the chair here. So let's just go ahead and try 
even though we're looking at this and thinking alternating series tests, let's try the uh, ratio test. And this is, again, this is a really, really good example and opens the door to, you know, when you think about justifying the test is inconclusive, ladies and gentlemen, all you have to do is just show an example where that's the case and you're done. I mean, you say, well, consider this series and we know what it does. Consider this series, we know what it does. So I'll say more about that uh, as we get to it, but let's look at this. So for instance, we have the limit as n passes to infinity of a sub n plus one divided by a sub n. So let's just go ahead and fill in everything. Again, this gets very uh, recipe-like, but, but, but you have to really mind your P's and Q's, so to speak, have to be really careful. So now we're gonna replace all the N's with N plus one. So we get negative one. So now we'll have N plus one plus one, which is N plus two. And now of course, if N becomes N plus one, we get an N plus three. And then of course the n becomes n plus one. So we get n plus one in that case. And then of course here the n becomes n plus one and we get n plus two. So those are easy to, to just do uh, visually. Now, of course, we want to reciprocate. So basically flip the nth term. So we have n times n plus one. And then downstairs, again, we write the numerator we have negative one to the n plus one times n plus two. So again, when you're affecting the division here, invert and multiply. That's the easiest way to write this. No need to write a complex fraction. That, that's a little bit untoward and, and, and is gonna be more of a source of mistake than anything. So invert and then multiply. That's the easiest way to do this and, and maybe avoid some unnecessary errors. Now, when you look at this, let's just go ahead and group everything together that's similar to make the algebra easier. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity. So put all of our changing uh, negative ones together, our changing signs. So negative one, n plus two, negative one, n plus one, and if you like, we can just go ahead and pair up the similar things, n over n plus one, and then n plus one over n plus two. Product rule, right, <laughs> of limits, and then n plus three over n plus two. Just pair everything up. Like we're doing uh, sine x over x in calculus, uh, one and we're making sure we have the, the, that special limit for each of the ratios. So, so this is an old trick. So now what we can see is of course, this is just gonna survive one of the ones. N plus one of the negative ones will absorb here, leaving us one copy of negative one. So this will be the limit as N passes to infinity. We can go ahead and just say, this will just be the absolute value of negative one because again, negative one to the n plus two is just negative one to the n plus one times negative one. So when we divide, and this is a, this is a common uh, execution that goes on quite a bit with these types of calculations. So, so when we use the laws of exponents, you can put your one there, we see that these absorb and we're just left with the negative one. So this is a, uh, uh, execution or a type of, uh, I, I guess, algebra that you're going to see with the laws of exponents that occurs often with the negative one. And you do it all the time, but students look at the negative one and somehow turn off their brain. So, so just remember laws of exponents here, and you don't have to write this out in detail every time. You can say, oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to, everything's going to survive except or everything's gonna go away except one of the copies of negative one. And so that's what we have here. And then of course, 
with the remaining factors, basically we're saying the absolute value of a product is the product of absolute values. So all of these are what positive quantities. So we can remove all of the absolute values without having to write separate absolute values for each one. So, so again, another thing that we will use often is that if you have A times B in absolute value, this is the product of absolute values. So here uh, we'll have the absolute value of each of these. So just for this time, I'm gonna go ahead and write it out, but I won't require you to do this in the future. That We haven't even done it before. So because we have so many more factors, I don't want it to be a source of confusion. So we've got all of this. Like that. So now, now it's basically the limit of a product. So this gives us the limit as n passes to infinity. Of course, the absolute value of negative one is just one. So we have n, n plus one limit, n approaches infinity, n plus one over n plus two. And of course you can apply the limit to each factor like we've done before and skip some of these steps. I certainly would understand what you were doing but it's nice to write things out, at least to use the limit theory from calculus one. So we've got all these products here. The thing is, and, and this is what I'm trying to show you. Unfortunately, sometimes students start multiplying everything together. Don't do it. Please don't do it. That is a abject waste of time. And, and it is horrible mathematics <laughs> in the sense that you have to use the theory. So when you have all of this stuff here, you break it up into pieces. And then you say, well, these are all bona fide limits here, okay? And I've got the limit of a product, which is the product of limits. So many times what we'll do is we'll say, okay, we'll apply the limit here, we'll apply the limit here, and the product of those two limits will be the actual uh, answer that we're looking for. So again, just to re reiterate here, we have the limit of a product, which is now, once we retire the absolute values, the product of limits. So do not, do not start multiplying things together. And it, just like in, like in calculus one, when you did Riemann sums, it's the same thing. There's absolutely no difference. You do all of that multiplying and make three or four mistakes and get the answer wrong. So don't do it. So now, We've got, again, ratio of leading coefficients, one. Ratio of leading coefficients, one. Ratio of leading coefficients, one. So we get one times one times one. Well, that's one, okay? So this, this just makes a good example with some of the pitfalls of using the ratio test to kind of make you aware of some of the algebra with the laws of exponents, uh, the uh, properties of the absolute value. All of this we see very nicely here. These types of calculations will come up over and over again and what we will be doing today and in the next few lectures. So, so we want to use that. So now what we can see by the uh, ratio test that this is inconclusive. And maybe this was not a surprise. This is inconclusive. But then you're thinking, Right, but Professor Ron, you said something about the alternating series test. What were you meaning by that? Well, you know, if it doesn't work here, then we can say, well, we can try another test. So when this says inconclusive, it says try another test. I mean, if you're trying to apply a test and you can't get the hypotheses to, to satisfy, so to speak, then you can't use that test. It, it's, it, I mean, I don't think that's a difficult thing to understand. And so when we, when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, how would we do this? Well, we just apply the alternating series test. So now we can say, and this is a completely separate argument. So now with the alternating series test, the A sub N is just this part. So, alternating series test. And this implies the following. I'm doing this in red. A sub n is now 
n plus two divided by n times n plus one, okay? Very different. So now we're pulling apart the alternating sign part and the actual positive part of the nth term. So now when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, let, let's just kind of look at this in terms of calculus one. So this is really n plus two, and now we'll multiply this for effect because it's gonna be something that's important to us. So we can look at this and say, this, this limit we can compute as n approaches infinity of n plus two divided by n squared plus n. And so this is good. We can look for dominant terms here and we see that the n squared term dominates relative to the numerator, which is just a first degree term. So this limit is clearly zero. Again, using calculus one techniques with sequences uh, or the, the calculus one techniques applied to sequences because we can always go in that direction. And now of course, Sometimes simple inequalities don't always help us. So we can say let f of x, so set like we do before f of x equal to x plus two divided by x squared plus x. I think it's kind of silly sometimes when you expect me to believe that an inequality is true just because you wrote it down. No, I mean, you, 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 if it's not a straightforward inequality, with elementary techniques, you've got to apply some calculus. And I used to tell students, I said, how do you just write this down? Like, like oh, it's got to be true. Well, no, that's not a proof. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, we can just show this function is eventually decreasing and get the result that we want. So now f prime of x will just be what? One times x squared plus x, just applying the quotient rule, minus x plus two. And then of course the derivative downstairs will be two x plus one. Two x plus one divided by x squared plus x, quantity squared. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, well, this is a, this is a calculus one problem. So this is an interesting problem. And I'll use the next sheet to continue this. So let's go ahead and clean this up. So we have x squared plus x. And now we have a minus here. So I'll use a bracket. So we've got 2x squared. And then we have an x. And then a 2 times a 2x. So that's a 4x. And then a 2 times a 1, which is a plus 2. Divided by x squared plus x quantity squared. So now we have x squared minus x. So we have minus two x squared. And then of course, minus a five x and then minus a two divided by x squared plus x quantity squared. So let me move this up and get some more paper. So now when we simplify, we've got what? F prime is, so we've got, in this case, let me put in my two here, we need that. We get a negative X squared. And let's see, what else do we have? Um, yeah, that's a plus there. Good old typos for Monday morning. So we have an X minus a five X, so that's a negative four X. And then we have a minus two. So this gives us x squared plus x quantity squared. So again, this is just basic calculus one where we're using the quotient rule and we take the derivative of the denominator in, in this particular case. Um, let's see here. Um, notice notice when, we, when we do this, and this is very important, let me, use, let me use the notation. Let's just call this G over H. I use this all the time, but I hardly ever write it down. So when we do the derivative here, just to remind you, this is G prime times H 
minus G times H prime divided by H squared. I know we've used that a million times, but, but sometimes it's just good to see it. So of course, when we differentiate X plus two, we get one. We leave the denominator alone, so we get X squared plus X. And then we leave the numerator alone, differentiate the denominator, 2x plus 1, and then square the denominator. And then, of course, at this point, x squared plus x, we go ahead and multiply this out to get a 2x squared plus an x plus a 4x plus a 2, then distribute the negative. So we have an x squared plus x. So we've got a minus 2x squared, then a minus 5x, and then a minus 2. And so when we combine terms, we get a negative x squared, we get a minus 4x because we have x minus 5x and a negative 2. Very simple algebra, but this is kind of off the beaten path based on what we've been doing so far. So put this down and, and make sure you have that and, and just check and recheck like I do. That way you, you're always sure that your computations are good. Now, if you look at this and say, okay, well, what do I wanna do with this? Let's analyze this now like we're in college algebra. Factor the negative. So we have x squared plus four x plus a two. And then we have x squared plus x quantity squared. Now, when you look at this, you're thinking, okay, this is just a BV technique from college algebra. So we need to look for the BVs. So let's do that. So we've got a quadratic here. So we have B squared minus 4AC. And that will give us a 4 squared, which is a 16, minus a 4 times a 1 times a 2. So this gives us a 16. These are easy numbers. I don't even have to factor it even though I like to factor everything, 16 minus eight, which is a positive eight. So now when we look at this and we, we make uh, use of the quadratic formula, we have X now equals the opposite of B, the negative four plus or minus the square root of eight, which is two root two divided by two A, which is two. So we have X equals negative two plus or minus the square root of two. Now, again, this is, this is such simple algebra that we have to be actually much more careful with it. Because now it's not just a matter of doing one problem where all you do is this. This is just the part of a much larger problem. So now when we look at this and we say, okay, well, what are the two values here? We have an x1, we've got a bv of negative 2 minus the square root of 2. And then we have x2, which is negative 2 plus the square root of 2. Both of these numbers are negative. I mean, of course, the square root of 2 in absolute value, I mean, of course, this is like approximately 1.41. And so these are both negative values. So we're kind of clear here. So if we do just a basic sign test and use the uh, multiplicities of these zeros, we have negative two minus root two, and then we have negative two plus root two. And then of course, over here, we've got zero and other things. So when we do, when we look at this and say, okay, how can we evaluate this? We don't have to check all of these regions. This is how I teach my pre-cal kids. Let's just take, if you like, uh, something really simple, like a uh, over here, like a positive 10, okay? And then we'll do the test with this contraption. Okay, well, of course, the denominator is always positive, so that gets a plus, and we have a negative that's built in. We have a negative here that's built in from this sign, and then, of course, if we put in 10 there, that's plus. So this is clearly negative. So we're below above, below. So what we're seeing here is that this particular derivative is negative here and negative here. So this implies from calculus one that f prime is less than zero if and only if x lives between what? Negative infinity, negative two minus root two union negative two plus root two to infinity. But ladies and gentlemen, that takes care of us. So now 
This implies by using the calculus that A sub n is non-increasing. Non-increasing for n greater than or equal to one. And so if we look at the fact that we have the A sub n in limit zero and we have non-increasing, that satisfies the uh, alternating series test. So, so ladies and gentlemen, when you're doing elementary inequalities, they do not support something that's more complicated like this. And I used to even talk to some of my students in my honors classes that would I would say, so you expect me to believe that? Oh, well, it's, you know, it's true. I'm like, no, 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 no. You didn't prove it. So if you can't use simple inequalities to prove a result like non-increasing, a decreasing function, then you've got to apply some calculus. So this, this actually turns out to be a much more difficult problem than an application of the uh, ratio test, which is, in most instances is, is actually very straightforward. So now, what can we say? Well, the ratio test did not work. So this implies the given series, and it was what, 20 years ago. Let's write it down. The given series, n equals zero to infinity of negative one, n plus one times n plus two divided by n times n plus one converges by alternating series test. And then of course we have that very elegant result. The, the, the remainder is no larger than the first neglected term. And that my friends is, is a result that we wish was applicable to every series. That is a major significant result. Again, we still have to make sure we have the hypotheses for our particular uh, alternating series. It's gotta converge and it's gotta be what? Non-increasing, okay? You know, it's kinda, it's kinda funny that you can frame a certain convergence test that, that doesn't you know, apply to this nice first neglected term. So I think the author and, and many mathematicians, including myself, uh, prefer uh, this, this type of convergence test to give you uh, the flexibility of this result. So again, that's a very, very nice result. Alternating series test. Okay, now what I wanna do, I want to do, uh, let's see, let's do one more with the ratio, then I'll cover a couple of root tests. The ratio test is so, so major in its scope that, that we got to, we got to use it. I want you to get good at this. And of course, I'm, you know, I don't let you get by with anything. You know, you got to prove what you say. Uh, that's what you do as a math student, as, as a STEM major. So where else would the ratio test be useful? Okay, let's just say that we have products <clears throat> lots of times certain certain products of certain types of integers <clears throat> excuse me can be written in a formula but usually what happens is that we just have an ellipsis type deal where you see what the pattern is and then you just kind of look at it and say okay well the next term would be this and here's an example of that we have negative one then we have we have two four we just have a product of even integers so we start with two and we conclude with two n. So if n were equal to two, that number would be a four and we'd have two times four. So this just gives us a recipe for what the numerator will be in terms of a pattern, okay? Because many times the, the products are not written in formulas. I'm gonna show you a nice formula for the product of odd integers, which we will often have use of in this class. But we don't have as many nice product formulas, even though we could spend weeks on that. And then in the denominator, here's what you have. You've got an interesting uh, setup, two, five, you're basically skipping, you're adding three each time. 
So when we look at this, this is just 3n minus 1 when n is 1. This is 3n uh, minus 1 when n is 2. This is 3n minus 1 when n is 3. So we say 3n minus 1. Okay, so again, if n were 2, that would just be a 5 there. So this gives us a recipe to figure out what the particular nth terms are if we wanted to add some terms in a partial sum. So this is where you just take your hat off to the ratio test, because this is a prime example of where its use is, is, is just simply needed, okay? Nothing else we've done so far would, would be any good here. So we see this is, this is why we need the ratio test. So let's write this down. So let's do a proof. Now, of course, when I write these down, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not bothering to write converge or diverge. You know what we're going to do. So uh, just remember that, that if I don't allude to that and we're doing a series, we're going to try to figure out what's going on in terms of convergence. So let's go ahead and look at the limit as n approaches infinity. And of course, we'll do our a sub n plus 1 divided by a sub n. The, the, the ratio test gets a little bit more time because it has a little bit more punch to it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to replace all the n's with n plus 1. So we get negative one to the n plus one, two, four, six. And then of course we have two n, and then if n is n plus one, we get two n plus two. Again, if we replace n with n plus one, we get two times n plus one, which is two n plus two, all right? Downstairs, we do the same thing. So we have two, five, eight, then we have 3n minus 1, and then we replace n with n plus 1. So let's do a little sidebar, 3 times n plus 1 minus 1. This gives us 3n plus 3 minus 1, which is 3n plus 2. Now, of course, I know you could figure that out. You just add 3 to this. That's all we've done, but I don't want you to think that, that you have to always note that. So, so the quick way would be just to say, well, these all differ uh, by uh, three, like, a, like an arithmetic sequence. And so if you add three to this, you get exactly that. But it's basically replacing n with n plus one. So if you want to think about it that way, you can. Your choice. Does it matter to me? Now, we want to invert. So again, put this in the numerator, put this in the denominator, invert and multiply. So we get two, five, eight, three n minus one. And then here, of course, we have the negative one to the n. And then we have two, four, six, concluding with uh, two n. So again, remember, invert the numerator, the denominator becomes the numerator, the numerator becomes the denominator. Now, this is where, this is where we, we don't have to work so hard. Notice, notice, this is where you think, wow, look at the ratio test. Absorb all of this. You don't even have to rewrite it. All of this goes away. Absorb. Same here. absorb. You don't even have to write an extra step if you don't want to. This clearly, because we've got the product here and we're writing it in a way that's user friendly, you can shift everything down a ways. And that's what I'm going to do in the next step, just to make it perfectly clear what I'm doing. So I'm going to break this up. First, we're going to have the negative one to the n plus one and then the negative one to the n. And now I'm gonna put all these on top. So we'll have what, two times four times six, two n, do the same here, two times four times six, two n. And then the next step, 
2 times 5 times 8, 3n minus 1, same here, 2 times 5 times 8, 3n minus 1, and then the stragglers. Or who are the stragglers? 2n plus 2, and then 3n plus 2. Those are the stragglers. So like I said before, absorb. And you don't have to put a bunch of slash lines. I, I, I will never understand that technique and, and it, 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 it just incenses me. Why would you ever want to put a bunch of slash lines through your work so you can't read it? That is one of the silliest things in the world. That's why I put boxes around things. I, I try to tell my pre-cal students and then some students still do it when they've heard me say it a million times. And I think to myself, so your boss is gonna ask you to do something a certain way and you're just not gonna do it. I'm thinking, okay, that's not really being a team member. Uh, I want everybody to have an identity, but I want you to have good techniques. When you do a presentation to your colleagues, I want you to do nice, clean mathematics. Slash lines don't do anything, but show that you probably don't know what you're doing. Okay, so now these are all gone. And of course, the only thing that survives here is the negative one. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity, negative one, absolute value. And then of course, we have the stragglers over here. Our friends, 2n plus 2, 3n plus 2. So now of course, we have one. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity of 2n plus 2, divided by 3n plus 2. And of course, now we have equal powers, and then we have what we call a ratio of leading coefficients, which is 2 thirds. So you can see that though this is much simpler than applying the alternating series test where we have to use calculus like we did on the last problem, you can see how powerful it is. And so now this implies that the given series, n equals 1, to infinity, negative one to the n, two times four times six. So this is our cheap way of notating a finite product without a formula. Sometimes the formulas are more complicated than actually writing this out. So, so in some cases, if you're doing, if you've got a product that recurs often and you want your uh, uh, notations to be a little bit more compact, then there's probably a good use for it. But right now this will be more than sufficient. And then we have two times five times eight to three N minus one converges by ratio test. So I want you, I want you to realize the power of the ratio test with certain types of nth terms. Clearly, clearly if you see a series and you're like, that's an alternating series, and I can show that's non-increasing, clearly the limit's zero, I'm gonna use the alternating series test. So there might be cases where you can spare yourself the time of, of getting a one and saying, I knew this was gonna happen, I should have just used this test. So, so use that example to say, okay, hmm, that doesn't look like something I need a new test for. So, so exercise that flexibility when you're working on problems. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Now, let's see, you're thinking, well, the root test is, the ratio test is so awesome and so wonderful. Why do I need another test? Well, let me show you um, some uses of the root test. And again, when you get bored after you look in the ebook and look for different problems and you look at practice tests, you can always make up your own problems. Just mimic the ones you've already done. So say we have n equals two to uh, infinity and we have negative one to the n and we have the natural log of n to the n, okay? Now, the idea is, like I said before, there might be instances when these new tests are actually more useful 
because it's like we're thinking, you know, that it's absolute convergence. And when I say, when I say all of these here, when I say converges, these are all absolute, absolute convergence. I mean, the test is absolute. So when I use the root test, and of course, um, this is my example here. When I use the root test, I need to write in absolute. When I use the ratio test, I need to write in absolute. I'm just saying converges, but all of these are absolute. And that, that is huge. So, so make sure that when you use these tests, you're thinking even better. It's absolute. Not only is it convergence, it's absolute convergence. So, so you, as you just saw here, we're going to use the root test here. So let's, let's write proof. So we're going to have the limit as n passes to infinity. And so remember, remember, we're going to have the absolute value of the nth term, okay? And then we're going to raise it to the 1 over n power. Again, I'm just using this so we don't confuse anything. You don't have to use the parentheses, but I just want to make sure you get this correctly. So no ratio in this case. And then you might look at this and say, well, you know, Professor Ron, I could use the alternating series test, but it might be simpler in this particular case to go ahead and use the root test because I think it's going to be quicker. So now we've got what the limit as n passes to infinity. So we've got in this case, we've got the absolute value of negative one to the n divided by natural log of n raised to the n. Okay, just by the definition. And then of course, now we can be a little more flexible one over n, but I'll still use the parentheses here. Now let's apply the properties of absolute value. The absolute value of a quotient is the quotient of absolute values. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity. So we've got negative one to the n and then we have the absolute value of the natural log of n raised to the n, all to the one over n power, the nth root. Now, of course, for each n, we just take the absolute value. If we fix an n, this just becomes one. So we'll just say fix, fixed n, negative one to the n, is just negative one in absolute value raised to the n in this particular case, which will just be one to the n, which is one. So you don't have to, you don't have to do this calculation over and over. You fix an n, okay? And then you say, all right, we've got negative one to the n. Now we use the properties of the absolute value. This is a fixed n. The absolute value of a product is the product of absolute values. So this gives us negative one to the nth power. That is absolute value of negative one times the absolute value of negative one n times. But for each, for each factor, the absolute value of negative one is just one. One to the nth power is one. So you don't have to do this computation every time. So this is, this is a useful result. Useful result. So when we see something like this, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, of course, when we have the ratio test, everything goes away and we just have the absolute value of negative one. But what do we have here? Well, we have this result. So when we slap the absolute value on negative one to the n, this is basically just using the properties of absolute value for a finite product. And that indeed is one. So first you'll say this is the limit. And so of course, we won't do this every time. We'll refer to this. Maybe you should put that on a note card. So we have n passes to infinity. So now we have one. And then of course, in this particular case, we've got the absolute value of the natural log of n raised to the n, but n starts at two. And so this is a positive number for all values of n. So we can remove the absolute values. So we just have log n to the n. So now we've 
excused, we've excused the absolute values. So again, like I said before, the absolute values are not difficult, but we are going to use some of their basic properties. And, and, and one, two that we've used, again, the absolute value of a quotient is the quotient of absolute values, and the absolute value of a product is the product of absolute values. Again, very useful, and they sometimes, you know, it's like smoke and mirrors here. No, not even though it seems that way, it's very, it's very correct, and it's using the finite capabilities of both of those uh, results. So now we can apply the nth root to each of these. So this gives us the limit as n passes to infinity, one to the one over n. I'm doing all these steps just so you, you see this and being very detailed. Log n to the n raised to the one over n. So of course the nth root of one is one. That's not, that's determinate. And of course the nth root of ln to the n, the n times the one over n gives us one, and this just gives us ln of n. And now of course the logarithm function is an increasing function. So as n passes to infinity, this becomes unbounded. And so of course this limit is clearly zero. Now you might be thinking, well, this, this doesn't seem so easy. Well, it is easy. It's just that I have to kind of cover all the bases that you see with the root test. Remember, remember the absolute convergence requires us to contend with this absolute value, okay? And so we're gonna use these types of results over and over. So you don't have to, you don't have to reprove this every time. For instance, when you get to this point, you can apply this result and go from here to here. That is fine. Um, if you wanna write this out, that's fine. But, but, but again, I think this is a direct application of the uh, properties of absolute value, which I will allow you to use. So if you go from here to here, I will, I will be fine with that. That won't be something that you have to justify. But if you don't understand it, you need to write this down and think about it, put it on a note card. And now of course, this will imply that the given series, and I'll write absolute down this time. I've been a little bit negligent of that. Negative one to the N over the natural log of N to the N converges absolutely. So I should have been actually writing that down every time because this is absolute convergence uh, by root test. Excellent result. Beautiful result that we can now handle with a new test that's not so bad. Again, we just have to think more about absolute value. So absolute value is your friend. It's not your foe. It's good for you. It, it, it will help you out when you need it. Now, let's look at a couple more, and then I want to uh, look at a, uh, a proof of part of the root test. Now, let's see here. Uh, this will actually let us use one of the uh, nice results that we have from our special limits. And let's see here. Yeah, there's another, there's another ratio test that I might throw in too. Okay, so we have n equals one to infinity. Now, this is kind of like one we've done before where, where we had something that was getting in the way we're thinking, um, are we okay? You know, we've got this N up here. Is that still going to mess things up? We, we, we're kind of thinking, you know, the three to the N, you know, it doesn't matter if we get a zero limit with the nth term. That doesn't matter at all. That says nothing about convergence. But we're thinking, is this going to get small enough, fast enough, so that the actual series converges? And so because we now have the root test and we've got this nice power three to the n in the denominator, we're thinking this would be an excellent application of the, of the root test. So let's see that. So again, 
whatever test you decide to use is, is you. I wanna use the root test here because I want you to see the root test in action. But then you're thinking, you know, if you wanna apply another test, go for it. So proof. Now, what we wanna do is look at the limit as n passes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n nth rooted. Now, of course, Another way, and let me just go ahead and write this down. Another way to write this is a sub n and absolute value. And then of course you can use the classical uh, radical formulation and do it like that. And there's, that's very nice looking, but this is much more computationally oriented. So if you, if you want to just kind of think, well, that, this means the same thing as this, that's fine, but for computations, this is more useful uh, for what we need to do. So you may see this particular result written this way. Just make the connection that these are absolutely the same. It's like saying x to the one half or the square root of two. It's the same thing. This just act is actually more convenient computationally. So that's why I'm choosing to write it this way. So now we have the limit as n passes to infinity and so we have the absolute value of n divided by three to the n, again, nth rooted. Now this doesn't have nearly as much stuff in it because it doesn't have the alternating sign. Again, we know that the alternating sign just gets uh, forced into one. But once we have the absolute value of that using properties of absolute values, we can dispose of that quickly. But notice these are just positive entities. So we don't have to worry about that. So this is going to limit as n passes to infinity. Again, n over three to the n uh, for n equal one to infinity. These are always positive. So we can remove the absolute values. So we have n divided by three to the n nth rooted. Okay. And then now, of course, for fixed n, like we did before, we apply the laws of exponents. Again, Ladies and gentlemen, when you're working within the nth term, you're, you're, you're thinking, okay, I've got an n that I fixed. Let me see what that's going to do. And then, then you clean it up as you do, and then you let n pass to infinity. Again, it's like doing uh, improper integrals. You do all the tidying up. You do all the algebraic work, pushing things together, making things compact and and putting them in form so that you can work with them. The, the thing you find out in calculus is that you can't be so sloppy with the way you write things because there's so many steps in the problem. You know, it's not like you just got one step and you're done. The problems get longer and longer and longer. So we have to do the tidying work in a way that sets us up for the next step. So now we can apply the nth root to the numerator and the denominator. So this is the limit as n passes to infinity. So we have n to the one over n, of course, that's a special limit. And then we have three to the n to the one over n. Now, of course, this gives us the limit as n passes to infinity. So we have n to the one over n. And then of course the n one over n, these absorb and we just get a three. How convenient. So now, of course, we can factor the three, that is the one third. So we have one third limit, as in this reminds you of the test you just took. You had to do L'Hopital's rule on problems like this. And this was mimicking this particular special limit. This limit is one. And you you saw the use of that on the test or or, or you, <laughs> Or you were like, oh, I'm sad I didn't get these right or whatever, but, but you know I focused on that. The, the test was really focused on the things that I spent the most time on. And so when, when, I, when I talk about something in class, I definitely mean I want you to learn it because I'm not going to waste your time. Uh, the things that I cover are the things I know that you need to learn about as you continue in the course. And uh, so keep that in mind. That, that's, that will never change. And so, of course, this is just a special limit. This limit is one. So we get one third times one, which is one third. 
Well, again, this is less than one. So this implies, so now you're thinking, okay, the ratio test verifies that we actually do get convergence here, that that n's not gonna mess things up, so to speak. So this implies that the given series, n equals one. Now, of course, if we just wrote converge, that'd be fine because the automatic absolute is there because these are always positive. But we'll say that the given series converges absolutely. by root test. So the, the beauty of these types of problems is basically what you're seeing um, in all of them. When they work, we actually have a much more elegant way. I mean, all the other tests we did, I think were very elegant, but look at, look at how nice these are. They're just, it's like, wow, that, I didn't expect this. I thought this would be, you know, like just plain mundane test. This absolute convergence test is certainly worth it. We've got the absolute values to contend with, but we see that the utility that we get from this is important. And that's why I like to spend plenty of time on this. And then, of course, we'll do our Taylor's theorem next class. Now, let's go ahead and look at another example. And then we'll talk about justifying the root test. So we have n equals 1 to infinity. And this one's really odd looking. We have n factorial raised to the nth power. So you're thinking root test. And then we have n raised to the n, just some really crazy stuff squared. Now, of course, we can use the laws of exponents on this, but when you look at this and you think about what it is we're trying to do here, you're thinking, wow, this, this has got to be the root test. I mean, that we've got these powers of n and we need to get rid of them. But notice here, and this is very, very interesting. We have n factorial and we have n to the n. Both of those are very dominant terms, so to speak. Uh, which of them wins? You know, which, which is the more formidable opponent, so to speak? And this is where you're thinking, not sure, maybe that factorial will win out because we've seen that it's pretty, pretty formidable, pretty, pretty large, as n gets large, it just blows up, you know, even faster than any exponential function. So first what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rewrite the nth term just to make it more user friendly to the uh, process of nth root. So I'm just going to flip these around. So this will be n squared raised to the n, just using laws of exponents for a fixed n. So now let's do a proof. Again, we're going to use the root test, proof. So now we're thinking, okay, we have the limit as n passes to infinity of the absolute value of a sub n nth rooted. I always want to write this down just to remind you of the test that we're applying. That way you always know what we're going to do. So limit as n passes to infinity. So we have what? n factorial raised to the nth power divided by n squared raised to the nth power, nth rooted. And of course, the, the main thing here, ladies and gentlemen, is to write things in this factored form. So it's really, really easy to apply the one over n or the nth root. That's the, that's the key here. Now, of course, uh, both of these, as we see, these are positive quantities, n equal one to infinity. The n factorial by definition is positive. The n squared clearly n positive is positive. So we can retire the absolute values. This is clearly a positive number for each value of n. So this gives us the limit as n passes to infinity of n factorial raised to the nth power divided by n squared raised to the nth power, all nth rooted. 
it seems like we just made this up. I'll show you in the justification that there, there, there's a reason why this actually works. So now we can apply the nth root to the numerator and the denominator using the laws of exponents. So we get n factorial, nth power, raised to the one over n power, and then we get n squared, nth power, raised to the one over n. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity. Now, of course, we have n times one over n, which is one. So we just get n factorial. And then of course, downstairs, the n's absorb, the n and the one over n absorb, and we just have n squared. Now we can, we can dress this up a little bit. We can take two powers of, two factors of n away from the n factorial. So this will be n <clears throat> passes to infinity, that limit. <clears throat> And so <clears throat> when we think about this, we have the n and the n minus one. So this will be n times n minus one times n minus two factorial, just pulling off two of the upper factors. And then we've got an n times an n. So this gives us the limit as n passes to infinity. Uh, just go ahead and pair them off, n over n times n minus one over n times n minus two factorial. Now, of course, this just absorbs, so this absorbs. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity of n minus one over n times n minus two factorial. Now, when we apply this and we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, this, this part is just going to converge to one if we take the ratio of leading coefficients. So this will give us the limit as n approaches infinity of n minus one over n times the limit n approaches infinity of n minus two factorial. Now, of course, this is just one, but factorial clearly diverges to infinity. So this is just one times infinity which is clearly determinate, which is infinity. Now, this is not a surprise. There, there is no surprise to this whatsoever. We look at this and say, we didn't think this would converge, but again, <clears throat> into, into the end is, is a strong candidate as far as rate of growth. And so you can't just say, well, you know, I, I think it diverges. No, that's not a proof. So we can see here, at least when our intuition is saying, hmm, I think it diverges. I think this is gonna grow fast enough that, that, that we can do away with this. And so now you're thinking, you're thinking with this, could we use the divergence test, the nth term divergence test? Well, when you look at this, you could, you could kind of look at this and say, well, you know, if you, if you manipulate this like this and say n factorial, over two, this could have been taken care of with the nth term divergence test, because clearly that would not have zero limit. But again, I'm just kind of making use of the root test to see that we get divergence. So as an alternate, alternate, and you always have that possibility. If you look at this, this is just n factorial over n squared raised to the n. And if you look at this limit, uh, here, this is basically what we did here. That's infinity. This is clearly not zero. This does not go to zero. So that would be an alternate. We could say diverges by divergence test. Nth term divergence test. That'd be another way to do it. But I wanted to use this, but you see you get the same, you get the same computation right here. So forgive me for doing that, but I wanted to, I wanted to give you practice with the root test. So we'll say uh, in this case, series, we got two options here, series n factorial n into the n squared diverges by root test. So, you know, the, the thing is, if you apply one of these absolute convergence tests, 
you've got that third option where you get infinity and you're thinking, oh, you know, that's kind of what this is. I mean, this is, you're thinking this is kind of like the nth term test right here, you, you know, kind of pushed into it. And so, so when you, when you do this, you're kind of doing that. And that's what makes this test very robust because we see this computation is right here, basically. Basically, when you go inside, you've got this right here, exactly. So, so the divergence test is kind of built in to the ratio test and the root test, most specifically with the root test. So, so again, you, you, have your, you have your flexibility here, but I would say if, if you know, you've got the nice application of the root test, this would probably make you feel a whole lot better because it just unravels and you've got that third conclusion that says, okay, if you get an infinity, you're done. So this is a way of characterizing divergence within, within the convergence test without having to directly say, okay, that's the divergence test. So I think, I think it's interesting how you see the interplay uh, between the two results. I mean, that's what you get with mathematics. Mathematics will never forsake you. Everything else you have to worry about, but math is really the most pure science we have when it comes to logic and reasoning. Even though it has its kinks, uh, it's certainly much more uh, cogent than, than most uh, studies. And, and I've studied pretty much everything. And I, and I have an appreciation obviously for or music and music theory and performance. I mean, but math and music are two of the things that kind of intertwine the most because they both rely upon arithmetic. So that's a good thing. Now, what I wanted to share with you here is just a little uh, uh, motivation behind why this works. That is, if we look at this, we let the limit as n passes to infinity of uh, the absolute value of n raised to the one over n equal L, just like we did when I stated it. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to fix R in the real numbers such that this is gonna create a geometric sequence, such that R lives between L and one. So I'm looking at the convergence conclusion. So if, if we get a limit that's less than one, then of course there are infinitely many real numbers between one and the limit. You just pick one. We're going to pick R and we're just going to stick it right there. So this is a number between L and one because there are infinitely many, but that gives us an epsilon. So set epsilon equal to R minus L. Now, what I've done here, I've, I've added a little bit of flexibility to the definition of convergence. Then there exists n in the natural numbers, and I'm just going to say greater than or equal to, such that make the notation a little bit easier. It doesn't matter. If n is greater than or equal to n, you can have it strict or you can just say, well, I'm just gonna take the n where, where it works and move on after that. n greater than or equal to n implies that we can make the absolute value of n, now be more less, more flexible with my notation. Now that you know what that means, I'll just leave out the parentheses. We're gonna say that we can make this particular nth term very close to L. And we're gonna make it within, uh, in this case, epsilon right there. So this will be less than R minus L. So if we have the existence of a limit, then that means that for every epsilon, we can actually make the limit and the nth term close together within epsilon. Okay, that's just the definition. We have to go far enough out in the sequence so that we can write this. And that's the key. Now, what does this mean? Well, what do we do? We just unravel this because that's all we know how to do. So this is a conjunction. So we have the negative of R minus L is less than the absolute value of A sub N to the nth root 
minus L is less than R minus L. Now, the important part of this is actually this part of the inequality, because this is going to give us the nice inequality that we need to push this argument forward. So now notice that the L's absorb. And so we have zero is less than the absolute value of a sub n to the one over n. And, and what's interesting here is that since this absorbs, we have less than r. So when you look at this and you think, okay, well, so what's that going to do? Well, now we're going to apply the power function in. So apply the power function. If and only if the absolute value of a sub n is less than r to the n. And of course, this is an increasing function. And boom, there we have it. And this, again, I'll just reiterate for n greater than or equal to big N. So now here, let me use red. So when you look at this and you think about what we're doing here, n and greater, we have this for every term. That is the absolute value of a sub n is less than r to the n for uppercase n and then n plus one, r to the n plus one, boom, boom. We just basically get a what? we get a convergent geometric series that we generate because R in absolute value is less than one. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty behind this result. And there we have it again, that geometric series just boom right in our face. It's like, hello, everybody. I'm a convergent geometric series. Is that a good thing? Well, absolutely. So, so again, we, we, we are, tied to the geometric series like we're tied to the Pythagorean theorem. We, we certainly couldn't do much trigonometry without it. So now, now what we can do is go back to the original series. See all these absolute values here, ladies and gentlemen, is what gives us the absolute convergence. So this should make you understand at least a little bit more about absolute convergence and why we actually distinguish it from just regular convergence. So now, this implies, let's go ahead and write it down. We'll have the series n equals one to infinity of all of these terms. So we're slap, remember we slap absolute values on everything and that could mean whatever is in the nth term. The, here the a sub n represents everything, okay? Just using the notation of the text. So now we can write them down. Let's write all of these down up to n minus one. So this will be a sub one, a sub two, and let's just keep continuing until a sub n minus one. And then after that, we're gonna bump to this one because that's when we're gonna start using what's in the red box. And then plus, now we'll just write the other terms. I'll write these out so it's easy to see. a sub n plus a sub n plus one, et cetera. So we've kind of made a distinction between the first finite number of terms that don't apply to the red box. Again, this is just, you know, maybe n is a million or 10 or five or whatever, it doesn't matter. This is a finite number of terms. It clearly converges. And so with this part, we don't have any nice inequality, but for n and greater, we can apply the red box, okay? So we've broken, this, broken down the series into the finite sum plus the infinite sum with this proviso that we can now use this inequality, okay? So again, just writing out all the terms with the ellipsis to make it perfectly clear what we're doing. Now we have an upper bound, so this will be a sub one in absolute value plus a sub two plus all the way to a sub n minus one. It just really depends how you set up your hypotheses, ladies and gentlemen, as to how this is going to look. It's not, it's not difficult. Just set up your hypotheses the way you like to do it, just like I've done here, very simply. And now we can make replacements. This is, has an upper bound of what? R to the N. Just apply this result to this one. 
This one has an upper bound of r to the n plus one. And then of course the next one will be r to the n plus two, right? The one I left out, et cetera. But now that's geometric. My goodness, how much did I talk about geometric? This is geometric. And it's also convergent. Okay, convergent because of this restriction here. So now what does this give us? So we have a sub one plus a sub two in absolute value plus a sub n minus one. I'll make that a little bit longer. And now of course you can factor the r sub n out of this, r sub n and that'll give us one plus r plus r squared plus r cubed, et cetera. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, what is this gonna be? Well, we can write this as a series. So we've got what? A1 absolute value plus A2 plus a sub n minus one. And now we can use the formula. This will just be one over one minus r. So this will be r sub n to the n times one over one minus r. Now, again, th this, this, is, this is actually very interesting because we see when we look at this series here, it converges. So this is less than infinity. That is, we have a finite number plus a finite number, which is clearly less than infinity. So what we're seeing is that this series here is basically a convergent series, which is an upper bound for this series. So we see this implies that the series that we started with n equals one to infinity, absolute values of all the nth terms converges. And I don't have to say absolutely because it's got the absolute values. I'll just kind of say absolutely, but that's what we started with, right? That's why it's kind of sometimes easy to leave out. We, we got the absolute values for free, converges by direct comparison test. And the, the, the series is right here. It's this one right here. This series converges by using the geometric. So the series that starts out with these first n minus one terms, and then all these r terms converges. And therefore, if we compare uh, this to that, we're done. So, so the, the key here, the key here is we get a nice upper bound series using the geometric. That is, this new series here converges. And it, it, the inequality that we have here provides the allusion to the direct comparison test. It doesn't matter how many terms proceed. Okay, we just got a finite number of terms, but once we hit in, we've got control over the size. So boom, you see that the geometric, the geometric series allows us to write this test. And so now we can see that, that when we get a limit that is indeed less than one, this geometric series controls the convergence. So, so this, this conclusion here uh, that we can make for absolute convergence rests upon the utilization of the geometric uh, series which converges. So, so what I think is so nice about this particular test is that it uses theory that we've already developed. Now, one last thing, which is interesting, the divergence is clear. If the, 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 the nth term goes to infinity, then there, there's nothing you can do about that. That's the easiest part. But I just wanted to say one thing about the inconclusive part. And you can, you can test this. For instance, if we look at one over n 
n equals one to infinity and n equals one to infinity of one over n squared. If you look at these two series here, you know this one diverges. This is the harmonic series, diverges, and this one converges. Now, if you apply, if you apply the root test, you get one in both cases. So apply root test and get L equal one in both cases. Easy to show. Easiest thing we've done all day. And this implies inconclusive test. Why? Inconclusive test. Well, it applies inconclusive because if you get the same value for L for a convergent series as you do a divergent series, then the test does not provide a conclusion. It's giving you the same limit for two different convergence uh, characteristics. So that, that's all you need. When you have a test that can't distinguish, and it's not surprising that, it, that the test can't distinguish because it's reliant upon the geometric series. So that one is kind of like right in the boundary, so to speak. Less than one, you're fine. If you greater than one, you blow up, okay? It's like, boom, no, no dice, you won the lottery, so to speak. And one's kind of like in the middle. I'm not sure, just like we've seen before. So we actually, when I did the example with the alternating series test, that, that thought, okay, okay, well, we got one. So what's really going on? Well, this is what's going on. So, so if you've got the same value for L with series that do opposite things, then the test is not reliable. And so that means that you need to come up with something else. It doesn't mean that the series diverges. It doesn't mean that the series converges. It doesn't mean anything. That means you have to use another test. So where do we go from here? Uh, after on our next lecture, we're gonna talk about Taylor polynomials and Maclaurin polynomials and how we can use polynomials to approximate functions and then you're thinking, are we going to let n pass to infinity? Absolutely. That is, once we get these polynomials, then we're going to figure out that in the infinite case, do the polynomials actually converge to the functions that they represent? And we will learn how to do that. So um, go ahead and kind of work with the ratio and root test. I think you'll find them very edifying, very fun, you know, in the sense that you, you've got a test that's easy and it's very algebraic. I won't say it's easy so much, but now that I've shown you some of the ins and outs of it, it it's certainly a lot simpler than having to compute an integral, uh, which, which again is, is always a, you know, a challenging construct because you have so many techniques. Now, of course, we built other uh, tests and all, and, 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 and I will uh, probably make a little PDF do a scan of, of some of the tests that we have so far uh, and make that available to you. You can go ahead and look at your ebook and, and see that at the end, I think, of, of section six. And then as we move to the end of the chapter, there's going to be a nice summary of power series, which again will be a very uh, good uh, reference uh, as you take tests and, and, and work towards the final. So I appreciate your attendance today. Enjoy the nice weather. Uh, uh, again, busy time of the year, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, uh, I'll send out invitations today for uh, conference hours. Um, if I do not see you, then of course I'll see you on Wednesday. And if you like, go ahead and read a little bit about the Taylor polynomials. Uh, we probably won't spend as much time with the theory. Uh, we will spend some time, but, but I need to make sure that you understand how to work with them. And even though the theory for the root test was actually very relevant, uh, some of the theory behind the Taylor's theorem, though you'll see it written up in my Blackboard notes, very beautiful result. Um, it doesn't always help you apply it. So I'll kind of weigh back and forth to uh, let you know about how much theory I'm gonna give with that. But everybody have a great day and thank you for your attendance.